everyone my name is Tiffany welcome back or welcome if you've never been here before today we're doing another reading vlog now I want to read romances that defy death and time I got this idea from just really wanting to actually pick up my cover buys from the booktuber retreat. So Charmed by Katherine Hart. I love this cover. I'm not sure if we're going to be seeing it well because this ring light's really working for me, okay? It's doing its job. <laughs> I also have Time Kept Promises by Constance O'Day Flannery and I'm so obsessed with these. I might even just give you inserts. Um, I got the remainder of this series and so I really want to get to at least one of these during this vlog but I may not. I um, put a poll out on Instagram yesterday letting you know I was doing a themed vlog and asking which I should start one. It was between Charmed and Parallel by Elizabeth O'Rourke and Parallel by Elizabeth O'Rourke went in spades so I started reading that yesterday for reading sprints on Tori's channel and I got up to 20% and I am completely invested, riveted, and I need to know what the heck is happening with that freaking book. I had to pry myself off of the page so I could successfully start this vlog because I probably could have just binged it last night. I mean, it's following Quinn. She, at four years old, was privy to information that she should not possess. I mean, memories of a life that supposedly she had yet to live and screaming for a husband named Nick at the age of four. Okay, so uh, this immediately piqued my interest. We meet um, Quinn when she's all grown up now. She's actually engaged and she's learned to keep these thoughts to herself to avoid the slew of doctors and psychiatrists and their touring wedding venues, okay? She's about to get married and she gets triggered by the venue. She feels as though she's been there before. She passes out and has I don't know. I don't want to call it a hallucination because it's so vivid and in detail of her life with Nick, okay? The husband she was crying for at the age of four. And it's like, I know that Quinn is traveling, okay? This time I'm looking at context clues. There's a clock on the cover. I failed to recognize that. What does it hurt? I mean, I don't know how I didn't see the lighthouse. I just thought it was beautiful and I kept thinking, do not deface it with your makeup because it's white. Anyway. So I'm checking for context clues and I know that she's traveling, okay? But the kicker with this is that after she's passed out, she's had headaches, her fiance Jake and family are concerned, so Jake takes her to the hospital, okay? And her doctor is Nick. And what kills me about it is that she is privy to information from Nick's current timeline, okay? And I'm just using that terminology, you know, I'm a back to the future type of girl and I'm just spitballing here, but she's privy to a life that they have had together. And she knows things about Nick that no one else knows, things that he's already lived through, yet they've never met in this space and time and I just pride myself off at the point at which we've learned that Nick has seen her before as well in his dreams. I need to know what's happening, okay? And I love the little tinge of angst that I'm getting because they're both in other relationships, yet there's this inner knowing draw, pull, and freaking siren call between them and these vivid depictions of their lives together is just gripping me, okay? So I'm going to jump back into Parallel by Elizabeth O'Rourke, but because of that, because I had seen this book going around, because Parallel is only on my TBR because it was Jess's from Peace Love Books favorite of June, I just like put a question out there on Instagram asking if you guys had any other recommendations for time travel romances, reincarnation, because I needed to know. One book that I really hope to get to, which is like also one that I had in mind for this, was a debut novel from Naomi Loud. Okay, it's called Was I Ever Here? This is supposed to be a dark romance about a romance that spans across lifetimes. And I have to get into this. I am thoroughly, thoroughly intrigued. And then I want to check 
because since I put this question out, I've gotten the nails did. Okay, I mean, like, just let's give them a moment here. I'm not sure if you can see it. It's probably blown out by light, but um, I want to see what's going on with the answers to this because I know at this point I have seen a few recommendations that are the same. So at least I'll share those at this point. Let's get into those. So I know that Riley Marie and Jen from the book Refuge, my bestie, who always hits with the wrecks, they recommended The Surviving Trace by Kalia Reed. So I will probably try to get to that one because multiple people have recommended that. Also, from Carrie from Booked for Romance and also Melissa Rodriguez, okay? She's always feeding me the good wrecks. They both recommended Karen moaning to me. So I need to look into that as well. And I'm gonna continue to just key into this question box and see what I'm in the mood to pick up next. I know from Christy for Christy Reads a lot that Parallel ends on a cliffhanger and I'm probably gonna wanna jump into the next book. So I have plenty to choose from in this vlog. And like I said, I'm gonna continue to look at the answers within this to figure out what I'll read next, but thank you. Okay, thank you for answering this question because I'm really excited. This might turn out to be longer than I anticipated, but I'm expecting to get some good reads out of it. So very long intro, but I will be back after I run some errands and I have more thoughts on Parallel. getting the last corner of this coffee okay i am back with some thoughts i got some reading in at barnes and nobles i'm gonna show you what i got though first because i would like to start reading some more thrillers so last thriller that i read was the passengers by john mars so i have just been gleaning through riley marie's recommendations ever since sword heart which hit Okay, that was a five star read. I'm going to go into talking about that in my August wrap up. <sighs> but it's definitely a new favorite. That is a comfort read that I see myself reading for years to come. I believe Crystal described it as a hug and I absolutely concur. But anyway, I got um, Finley Donovan is killing it from Riley Marie. I'm very excited about this. I think I'll probably try to get to these at least by the end of October. Next month is going to be crazy with the new releases and I'm going to Wanderlust in San Antonio. I have The Push, okay? I have seen The Push everywhere. This was recommended to me by Riley Marie as well as Sam from Sam Reads a Little. If you don't know, she has a thriller recommendations video out on her channel. So I had to pick up The Push. I also have to turn down this ring light. I mean, it is really packing the freaking light. Anyway, next I have in my dreams, I have Hold a Knife, which was also recommended to me by Miss Riley Marie. I bought the ebook of The One by John Mars. Rachel from Rachel Reads and Sings has a recommendations video for like fast paced books to kind of get you out of a reading slump and she did it by genre so I got it from that and lastly I am currently working on a novellas that pack a lot of story recommendations video and I saw The Dare by Harley LaRoe. I did not pick this up when everybody else was reading it 
but it got me thinking that maybe I should check it out because I am looking forward to the losers that will be coming out I believe in October or even next month. I think this is coming, the lo Losers is coming out next month. So I really wanna get into this before then. And I don't know if this is gonna make it on my recommendations video because every single novella in that video is going to be ones that I continue to think about, but I'm excited about my purchases. And I do, okay, have an update on Parallel. And I'm trying to discern how I should update you on this book because the joy in this is theorizing and just being compelled to continue moving through it not knowing what's going on what i'm enjoying at this point is the angst and like the enlightenment they both are having in terms of how they're dissatisfied in the current relationships that they are in it's this guilt that quinn is harboring as the ebb and flow continues to happen between her life with Nick in these dreams. I mean, this is an all-consuming, passionate, vibrant love that they have. And when she awakens, she's in the arms of Jake and feeling guilty because she's cringing for the very first time. Jake, her fiance, is the man that her late father wanted her to be with. It was his dying wish that she would choose him because he knew that Jake would be there for her. May not be the most passionate relationship, but it's the most practical for her. And yet, because she is now privy to this life that she supposedly lived, or it very much feels like that. She is kind of poking holes in the logic of her choice with Jake and comparing him to Nick. And in the same vein, and in parallel, mm, no pun intended, you know, Nick is doing that with his relationship that he's clearly you know, settling for. He's clearly not compatible with the woman that he is with. And she knows this, okay? Because she's heard him speaking in his dreams to a woman um with love and affection and she has yet to hear that tone from him and so there's just all this relationship strife as he her doctor is helping her with her case and trying to figure out what's going on and so i just like the push and pull i like the rapture within the writing in terms of these flashbacks i am trying to piece together clues like i i just am enjoying myself <laughs> like I really am like this reading experience has been a lot of fun so I'm going to aim to not give away spoilers and maybe hit broad strokes when I do close this book out I'm not sure when I'll be back okay because I might just immediately jump into the second book and figure out a way to backtrack but alas I will be back when I have more thoughts I cannot wait <laughs> break down these pages because I was so upset that I left my freaking camera at home. You know, I haven't been doing car updates, but I have since gotten a new car and the air conditioning is quiet enough for me to update you in there. And so I really fumbled the freaking ball here, okay? Because I had a lot to say earlier and not enough phone storage to do it even though my phone has literally taken everything from me. I mean, every app photo and it still doesn't have enough space anyway i'm sorry i want to thank christy from christy reads a lot for listening to all of my dms today because what is geeking me out about this book is hmm, i said it to her and i think i said it on instagram today because i was just so like pent up is the mechanics of how the time traveling works, which I'm not going to get into because it's a spoiler, but I have literally drawn out <laughs> the timelines and specific events that have happened and things that have changed. And it is always something that I geek out on when it comes to reincarnation and time traveling. And that's really why I wanted to do this video because I love to see how 
different minds sort of map that out. And so as I was like bombarding Christy with all of my theories as to what could be happening, what really grips me is that, you know, these this is a romance. And so it's just so moving to me that no matter the risks and the high stakes and what it's costing Quinn health-wise or the freaking quagmires that go into traveling and the time lost, they're still the same souls that no matter what lifespan they are in, they find each other. And it just rocks me to the core. I really feel as though it is felt on the page, just the compulsion to be in the other's proximity. And also like, you know, the flashing memories and recollections, just the shared binding influence. I love it so much. I'm also thoroughly enjoying because it does sort of read like a love triangle being that Quinn is still going to marry Jeff. I mean, they are, you know, engaged and it is not a relationship of passion, yet she makes some strong and compelling arguments for Jeff. And I really liked that because otherwise I would be thinking, why haven't you left him? You're clearly meant to be with Nick. But her reasons for staying in part due to conditioning and living for others, um, her mother and, you know, for what's to be expected of her. But she really makes strong arguments for his character. And, you know, that does um, slowly begin to slip away as she's seeing it in juxtaposed to Nick's. So I loved that. It really makes it angsty. It really allowed me to see more clearly through her lens as to how Jeff has been failing her. But it really hasn't been Jeff that has been failing her. It's Quinn that's been failing to set boundaries and advocate for herself. And so I like that meditation in parallel, okay? I really feel like this needs to be a duet. It is one of my biggest pet peeves when I feel like it could have just been one book, okay? More definitely needed to be said. Also, there's a happy for now. So the first book immediately like, Christy, you were right, okay? I immediately had to jump into Intersect and Again, I just feel like I cannot talk about anything, but I will say, you know, I'm really enjoying Nick as a hero. Nick is also killing me. He's killing me because there are romance reasons as to why, you know, they can't engage in steam, okay? And he's just needs to get off of my page. He needs to get off of my page with his half naked swimmer's body willing to risk it all in order to put her first, seeing her in the way that she's never been seen before and whispering what he wish he could do to her. I don't wanna hear about it. I don't wanna hear about it unless we're gonna see it. He's driving me crazy. Oh my God. And I love him so much, just. <laughs> his willingness to you know, sacrifice. I am an acts of service girl. And so um, him being willing to set aside the heat that he has for her because it is for her greatest good just feels like, you know, it's just like raising like my love language boundaries and I'm just enjoying him so much. I really am. And also it's more than just an attraction. You know, I love these moments where, you know, they're ferreting out clues, things are being revealed as to what's going on and how it all works. And I love when he thinks of her and he thinks of how she would be interpreting this information because she's not at all spiritual or woo woo. And so some of the information that he comes across kind of makes him chuckle in light of like Quinn and how she takes everything in. And I like that. I like his nods to her character as well as like, their insatiable heat that they cannot quench that's driving me crazy. I need steam. That's all I'm gonna say. I need some steam here. 
I will say though that the longing almost feels like it. I'm gonna give her that. It really does. So I'm just being a little cheeky, but I am thoroughly enjoying this, okay? Um, I'm gonna get back into it. I'm hoping to get a lot done because I wanna get to work early tomorrow. The Jabberwockies are doing a scavenger hunt around the MGM property for the limited edition Funko Pops. So I'm gonna be doing that and hopefully I will be back soon with more thoughts. Funko Pop. I also have finished Intersect and I've started Was I Ever Here. So with Intersect, I gave it five stars. I really felt like this was truly a duet. And also everything feels like a spoiler. So I'm just going to say that I enjoyed the high stakes in this duet overall. I also was not expecting the twist at the end of Intersect. How heartbreaking and heartwarming it was. Also, I'll say I loved the mechanics of how everything was happening. Mm. One thing that did bother me though was all of the build up towards steam that couldn't happen for well established romance reasons. You know, I will give her that. But I still got tired of talking about what he was going to do if we weren't going to see it. Okay, that kept popping up again for romance reasons. I get it. But I really wish we would have figured out a caveat for more steam. That's all I'm going to say. I'm still rating it five stars and I thoroughly enjoyed this duet. I couldn't put it down. I could not put it down. I just kept going. I wanted to know what was going to happen next all the while knowing that somehow outside of there being an HEA, they were meant to be and it was all gonna work out. And I just, oh, there's something about that that kept me invested where it made all of the hardship make sense. And also the like slow depreciation of Jeff, her um, initial fiance, that is something that normally bothers me in love triangles because you know it has to happen, right? In order to be like on board for the end game couple. That too made sense to me, okay? And um, she was just coming live to all of the ways that she was settling in this lifetime, afraid to feel and afraid of loss. And so she's been aimlessly living life numb. And I love how Nick comes in and just awakens all of that for her. So I absolutely love to intersect, okay? I can't wait to get to books three and four. I'm not gonna do it in this vlog, but I'm definitely going to finish this series because I just could not put it down, okay? <sighs> then I started Was I Ever Here by Naomi Loud. I am only about like 12% the way in, okay? But I have to say, that her writing style, I'm absolutely enjoying. In fact, I mean, this isn't about comparing, but I just was thinking while I was in this that like the last new to me author was H.D. Carlton with Does It Hurt? And I remember there was a long beat there in the beginning before I got to some poignant moments where I felt like I was letting her writing style wash over me. And here I was just gripped by it. It has something that I normally look for in scripts, like ABCs, okay? Which is that the story starts right on time. We get a flashback in the prologue, but it's just enough 
for us to be introduced to this all-encompassing romance, okay? And how that level of love sparks turmoil between them. I mean, I'll also say her use of lyrical, purple prose, flowery writing, how, whatever you want to call it, is really smart because she is using things that I find tangible, that I can like picture to describe what should be undescribable, which is reincarnation. And so I love how when we meet Byzantine in the first chapter, we know that he's from the prologue. We know that he has somehow jumped onto a different lifetime. And the recollections that are going through his mind as he's coming to in the hospital, she describes them as if they're like waves. And that's not like a direct quote, but again, it's something that I can latch onto and I could key into and have like a visual reaction to what the character is feeling. And I just am loving that about her writing style in this. And she's not heavy handed with it too, okay? She can ebb in and out of that and still give me a story that I am completely invested to in at this point because Byzantine comes to after nearly dying after an attempted murder, okay? And as he comes to in the hospital, he's remembering all of the lifetimes that he's had before. He's remembering Anthony when he was Gabriel. And he also has the memories from this lifetime, which I was hoping it was gonna be MC or Mafia, but he is the right-hand man to this like powerful criminal organization. He's responsible for money laundering, you know, so it has that sort of edge and he's hell-bent on finding the man that slit his throat. And um, that brings us to Sonny, who was once Anthony in a past life, which I love that reincarnation is non-freaking binary in this. It's just, oh, there's so many things about it that I'm loving so much that's so smart. But we meet Sonny and she is living a life of reinvention, I'll say. It feels as though she's running from something. She's constantly trying to numb herself out through sex, through drinking, partying, anything that can get her outside of her body so that she doesn't have to be swallowed whole by her depression. It seems as though she's lost somebody very close to her. And she also has found a best friend, which I always love, like vibrant side characters that she works with. And so Sunny clocks into work, she works at a bar, and um, the owner of that bar is the same man that tried to take out Byzantine. And so their meet cute in this lifetime is of Byzantine holding a gun to her boss's head and um, the head of their organization, quite frankly, wringing her neck so that she'll keep quiet. Not really what he was <laughs> hoping for, but it is in that moment where he sees her eyes and instinctually knows that that's the soul that he has been longing and looking for for the past five years. And at this point, you know, we're um, at the stage of stalking, okay, under the guise of making sure that she'll keep quiet from what she knows. And so I'm drafted in. Um, I like that she's unaware, although he is and he doesn't really know what to make of it. He can't explain it, he just knows. And yet she has a very visceral response to being in proximity with him that she can't explain either. So I am very invested, I'm really excited. I like some of the choices that she's making with the writing. Like I said, she doesn't stay in the purple prose, it doesn't stay flowery, it's used to really telegraph these moments between them and I'm loving it so far. I also kind of want to do the spinner wheel, okay? I have gotten 
all of the recommendations in at this point. So if you submitted a recommendation after my question box on Instagram, thank you so much. I took all of them, including the DMs, and I threw them in a spinner wheel. I actually got a lot of doubles. I got a lot for Surviving Trace by Kalia Reed. I got two for... I believe it was What the Wind Knows by Amy Harmon from Jamie and from Christy from Christy Reads a Lot. So thank you, Jamie. You sent me a lot. I appreciated it. I also got a couple, I believe I mentioned this before, from Karen Marie Monning from Carrie from Books for Romance, Emma Lisa, okay, who's always giving me great recs. Also, I want to see if there's anything else. I also got a recommendation for what may or may not be a romance okay but i'm not at all mad at it because of the way that lauren described it she described it as the hero chasing her through time and it never being aligned just so and so i'm still gonna read it if it comes up in the spinner wheel that's my name is memory by ann brashares so i'm like thoroughly interested there's even a book that i started reading during feral Fed, but i kind of didn't get through it it wasn't a dnf i just did not get through it and that is the longing of the lone wolves so i'm going to get into the spinner wheel okay i tested it out when i only had like one input to make sure that there was um clicks and confetti because that's kind of a requirement i just love it it's just like it makes you feel good so okay let's get into it mm. i'm excited i think i'm gonna try to read two but we are kind of like getting towards the end of the month and i want to get this out so maybe i'm just gonna spin for one at this point i'm gonna spin for one so this will be the next read in the reading vlog <laughs> <laughs> okay, Ooh, it's kind of fast, kind of fast. Okay, I love, I love doing this. What? Okay, I guess I'm supposed to read the surviving trays. I'm very excited. Okay, I got a lot of recommendations for that. I haven't looked it up, but I also think it's on KU, and I believe that there is an audiobook. Let's just look it up now. Okay, there is an audiobook. That's cool. I'm not sure if I'm gonna do the audiobook, but it's definitely on Kindle Unlimited. Let's see this. Okay, four men in a picture. You know what? I'm gonna be reading this <laughs> and I'm sure I will thoroughly go over what's happening here. Oh my gosh. I will be back when I have read some more of Was I Ever Here? don't do updates when I'm traveling just because it's so loud in the airport so this is gonna be the last update for this vlog because I finished the surviving trace but let's start with was I ever here by Naomi Loud I absolutely loved her writing style in this book there were things that I absolutely loved and then you know within the second act I felt as though there was a lull and I I don't know if that was purposeful or not because this book opens up really fast paced okay in terms of the setup and very quickly after I love how Byzantine forces proximity between them by buying the bar that she works at okay taking over for the man that he took out 
in the beginning of this book and so that really places him in a position to be possessive and insert himself into her life and I just loved how stern dominant and grumpy he was how he was all up in her face okay with their connection and so in the second act there was really this shift towards Sunny. It felt more character driven about Sunny's journey towards healing. There are heavy themes of grief, suicidal ideation, depression. Sunny is confronting her just mm, general exhaustion of existence. This melancholy that she's been buffeting not only in this life but in the many that she's lived prior. And it is because of that, that Byzantine has lost her. And it felt as though this was really about him saving her, her saving herself for them. There's a line in here that I think summed it up really well. The theme or the shift that I believe that this book goes into where Sunny realizes that it isn't love that she fears, it's life. So to commit to Byzantine would be to commit to doing life every single day, to love out loud every single day, and questioning if she has faith that their connection is strong enough or big enough to change that arduous task of living. And I thought that that was beautiful. I really did. I did, however, feel a lull in the middle of the book as well, being that after, you know, he becomes the owner of the bar and he is bulldozing her with his possessiveness, not letting her walk home alone, just stealing those moments in this lifetime while wrestling with how he's going to reveal to her who they were who they are, who they're always going to be to each other. And so there's this sort of like dance between them. They get sort of comfortable in that. The story falls flat in the middle of this book. And in the third act, he's committed to sort of, I don't know, waking her up to who they are. So I felt as though this was character driven. I really enjoyed the writing style. I'm really excited about the next book that's being set up between Byzantine's best friend who is the head of the Sin Eaters and Sunny's best friend. And so I'm definitely gonna continue on with the series. I rated this 3.5 stars. I do think that what she's doing in terms of mental health representation, I think because I can relate to some of the things in this book, it was hard for me to read at times because I do think it was appropriate for her to spend the time that she did on it. However, oh, I wish there was, I wish that the story was moving a little bit more. There, there was like a drag there in the middle and I felt sunken in with her there and I don't like I said I don't know if that was intentional or not um I'm definitely excited about this series I'm glad that I picked this up writing it a 3.5 okay moving on to the surviving trays okay <sighs> I loved this so much I'm upset that it's a trilogy and also excited that it's a trilogy all at the same time okay I am coming out of this with so many questions and I'm just Mm, I loved this. It really built on me as well. I mean, quite frankly, I started this book out in need of a nap and a snack, okay? But I really enjoyed how Kalia Reed introduces Serene and her fiance Will's relationship through the well-oiled machine of their routine, okay? It's not passionless, but it's more practical. They're comfortable with one another, not necessarily compatible. And I loved seeing that because they really are partners in life. And it felt as though they don't really spend that much time with each other, but they have gotten caught up in just, you know, the every day. And I thought that that was very, very relatable. Their interests are not at all in alignment. Serene is the owner of an antique shop with her best friend. And I mean, they're just breaking even, but it's her passion. And through a scene that should have been a date between them and turns into her having to put up with his friends, like it's very clear that they're not really on the same page in terms of depth. And oh, Serene has this 
vivid dream of saving the life of a man that she loved in the past to the point where she's willing to give her own for him. And she's so struck by it that it does throw them off of their routine and shortly after. Serene's best friend brings in new inventory, okay, to the shop. And it is there that she finds this photograph of four men in the 1910s, one of which is the man from her dreams. And she is so fixated on figuring out who these people were because one in particular she has this familiarity with. And so she's just enthralled by this, which Will finds obsessive, which I thought was a bit much. He does something in this book where I was like, stay in the damn past, okay? I don't know if you wanna hook your ship to someone that throws a tantrum anytime there's something that's displeasing. Will really took me out, okay? I'm just gonna say it because this is in the first 10% of the book, okay? He burns the photo. He takes the photo, okay, knowing that this is a treasure from history, knowing what that means to her, okay? But because he thinks that she's being obsessive, which I think is extra, it was like three days, okay, okay? He throws it into the fire. Mm. So, you know, we're having an argument here. She's sleeping on the couch and I was so excited when she went to the freaking sunken place and booted out on him. I was so pissed off with Will. I'm sorry. I have a lot of like thoughts on that, but we're not going to do this update and spin it on Will and what she doesn't choose. Okay. Um, but <laughs> when she's catapulted into the past, she believes that she's still dreaming, which is why, you know, I needed a snack because I was like, Serene, act as if, okay, play along so we can get these clues. They say no dream. But anyway, she's, <laughs> I'm sorry, she's basically at the soiree with guests that are in 1910s attire. They're speaking to her as if they have a storied history and they know her. And she basically learns that in this time and space, she's married and her husband despises her. She has been dropped right into marital strife that she does not own. She's trying to convince Etienne, our hero, her newfound husband, that she is not his serene and she's not of this time and space. And from there, this just pops off because, oh, it really started to pick up for me when he believes that she's from the future. Because at that point, there are so many moments where they slowly fall into appreciation, then attraction, and then in love. And I just found that so compelling to read, being that no one else knows that she's from the future. So she does have to sort of pose as the former Serene. They sort of have to fake being married. And there are moments in this because he's privy to the fact that she's from the future where they get to kind of meet on level playing field being that they both own businesses. I loved his genuine respect for her passion and her drive, her in return for the work that he puts into his legacy, especially being that the former Serene did not appreciate that, spent his money frivolously, slept around, made a mockery of their marriage. And it just felt so good to have ATN seen in that way. And for him to like reluctantly respect her as she's just reanimating their entire home through the staff and their family, as well as figuring out why she's been sent there because she believes that she's been sent to the past in order to help ATN. And there's this sort of shift that happens where that seems like that's going to be the key to get her back home. And yet it feels as though towards, you know, the middle of this book that she's doing it because she cares about him, because she values him as a man. And they're just slowly falling for each other, which is also problematizing the sort of ruse that she is the real Serene because the real Serene and Etienne would never show up like this for one another. And I just, mm, I also enjoyed how 
her attraction to him is dealt with because from the very beginning she keeps stating he's not the most handsome man but he has a masculine presence he doesn't have the most handsome face but and then that just slowly depreciates into her questioning how she could ever see atn as anything but and oh this has so many elements to it in terms of the time travel. I have so many questions about the mechanics of it all and I don't want to like give any more spoilers but just the progression in this romance. I absolutely loved it. I loved it and it ends on a cliffhanger okay. I feel like it's like a happy for now in terms of declarations and commitment but it does end on a cliffhanger where like I said I have so so many questions like I feel like <laughs> as desperate as she is to get back okay I'm not gonna say where when or how I'm desperate to get back into the series because I just want to know how it ends I also thoroughly enjoyed his brother's character his younger sister I've been calling her Nat because it's Natalie but it's spelled differently because they almost felt like Serene's helpers in this book. I really enjoyed jumping into this book after the last because there was their heartfelt romance in the midst of all this mystery centered around the time travel, how it works, who they should be looking out for. I mean there are so many things within this that kept it moving that oh, I want to rate it five stars. I really do. I want to rate it five stars. I'm rating it five stars. I'm rating it five stars. I'm going to stop rambling. I'm rating it five stars and I have to get into the next book. I just have to. I mean Lunatic by Only James has already dropped. It's 2.39 in the morning. I'm just full transparency here. I mean when you see these videos they're fresh off the editing table for me. I'm trying to fix that but I definitely am going to continue this trilogy. I absolutely loved it. I can see why everyone was recommending it to me. And I also am probably going to do another one of these videos because I definitely loved just, I think I've mentioned this, seeing how authors put their creative spin on reincarnation and on time travel. I find it so romantic that if the love is big enough, the connection is faded, the facts don't count. So I'm going to end this here. I have been rambling. Some of it I'm going to be editing out. Okay. <laughs> I want to thank you for joining me. Thank you for sending in your recommendations. I hope you can consider subscribing and sticking around and I'll see you in the next one.